A few months back, we pitted a bike that we found on eBay for £100 against this superbike, a Canyon Aeroad with Shimano's top of the range Dura Ace 9170 group set. And the results were pretty stark. This one was significantly faster. But what was really surprising was the margin of victory. I mean, this was on another level. And so it got us thinking, just how much money would you need to spend in order to actually shut that gap? And to be fair, many of you wanted exactly the same thing in the comment section under that previous video. So we have come back to our horrible climb and our tortuous descent and our flat time trial, but with this, a Canyon Endurace AL7. Now it retails for just over a thousand euros or just under 1,000 pounds, making it a purchase for a committed bike rider, but very much still in the mid-range category. It's got a lightweight aluminium frame, it's got Shimano's ever-reliable workhorse group set, the 105, and it's also got a very sprightly set of Mavic wheels on there. But just how much faster will this superbike still be? I'll tell you what, I'm going to need some help for this, actually. I can't do it on my own. Matt? Matt! Matt! We're going to test these firstly on our horrible climb. It's not exactly an Alp, but it's plenty hard enough. Although just two kilometers long, the average gradient is 11%, and there's a really big chunk at 22%. On a climb like this, the major difference in speed between these bikes is gonna come down to the weight. Now this superbike, if you remember, is no featherweight. Its major strengths lie elsewhere, but that aside, it's still pretty remarkably light at 7.3 kilos. Now remember, our cheap bike weighed in at 11.95 kilograms, but this mid-range bike, well, sorry, let's we're in 8.9 so that's a pretty bonkers three kilos weight saving between our bargain basement and our mid-range although clearly to save more weight is going to cost quite a lot more money in this case what's that like 1500 grams costing five grand hmm so sorry let's put our money where our mouths are yeah how much faster does 1500 grams get you a bit nervous. Yeah, I am actually. I know, it's a tough climb this, isn't it? It is. I remember how much it hurt last time. Right. You focused? Yeah, I think I am actually. Right then. Okay. I'm going to count you in. All right. All right. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Here we go. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, didn't get me foot in. Almost disaster at the start, but here we go. Run number one and I'm riding the air road and Matt is on the Endurace. We are gonna ride this climb flat out. And on paper, you might expect to see the air road have a margin of victory of about six seconds because of the weight saving. But the Endurace may just have a trump card because the 105 gears that are specced on there a compact, so that could allow us to ride the steeper section at a more comfortable cadence, a more optimal cadence. Now we spec the aero, meanwhile, with standard race-oriented gears, although it does take advantage still of the new Dura Race's ability to use a 30-tooth cassette at the back. But nevertheless, the smallest gear on the aero is still bigger. How'd that feel, mate? Pretty brutal, but not too bad considering it's my first ride for quite a long time. Yeah. It felt really light. Gear selection, although well, not quite as smooth as DI2. Functional, no issues with the gears, nice low, low gear ratio. And I actually managed to stay seated for the vast majority of the climb, which is saying something yeah. like that. Do you know what? It felt pretty good. What about you? Well, I can't complain, if I'm honest. Yeah. It's everything oh, yeah. you'd hope, innit? I was gonna say. Yeah. Well, not, I just say the chain's a bit dirty. Mate. Not, not, much top, it up a bit, but. not much top of that. Well, it's better than your shades. <laughs> okay, run number two, eh? I get a go on that one. Boop, 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 boop. Well, that was on, a quick one. That's not seconds. First time. You're in. Go on. Sweet as a nut. Tell you what. First impressions, very positive. Boop, 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 boop. 
He's in! Oh, here we go. Run number two and a quick bike swap. So that we haven't altered the bike spec at all, we're using PowerTap P1 pedals to monitor power output as well as just going full gas. Another difference between the two is that while the Dura-Race of the Superbike has a power meter option, 105 doesn't. As we mentioned, the Endurace is really light, particularly for the price. The frame is about 1390 grams, which is only about 300 grams more than the Air Road. His idea is to do max effort. Terrible idea. There he is. Super. Right, we're well, leaving aside the fun factor for yeah, the moment. Fun? Yeah. What are the results, Matt? Let's go straight in there. Well, 10 seconds quicker on this bike. 10 but, seconds. But for pretty much the same power. So wow. not much in it. No, well, to be fair, this one, or this one, I was even closer. Eight seconds eight faster seconds. on the air road. That's not much at all, is no, it? No, it's not. I mean, wow. to a certain extent, we can't be too surprised because a climb that steep doesn't really play to the advantages of our particular no. superbike. And the weight difference of 1.5 kilos, you know, that's not the be all and end all, is it? That's probably what's made the difference a shade of 10 seconds or eight seconds. Then the only other thing that can come into play really are the gears, but actually the difference in performance really between Durace and 105, it's quite slight, isn't it? It is, well the first thing to mention of course is that 105 is a bit heavier. So no, fair enough. So that's one of the contributing factors for this bike yeah. being heavier, but from a performance perspective, there's not much to separate them at all. There's 22 gears, Yeah. Um, they've got a similar array of ramps and pins. Now the, the main difference in relation to separating the price points is the materials used and also the manufacturing process as well. The only other thing that I noticed, and I don't think it affected the performance, just perhaps the fun factor slightly, was just the position. It's just a little bit more cramped yep. on the mid-range bike, but I could have sorted that out with a swap of the stem, which wouldn't cost much. Drop it 10 mil, get an extra 20 mil longer stem, and that would have meant that I probably felt a lot more comfortable. But that's just what I'm used to, I guess. As yeah, well. I mean, I felt exactly the same thing. Remember I said I spent most of the time sat down? Yeah. I must admit, when I got out of the saddle on the mid-range bike, it didn't feel quite as comfortable, but I felt pretty efficient sat down. Whereas on this one, I was out of the saddle a lot more. It just felt far more efficient. But again, same power, but 10 seconds quicker. So not much at all to call it, mate. Right then, mate. Challenge number two is calling. Break time. No, breaking time. Yeah, sorry, not brake time. On to challenge number two, braking. Last time, the might of the disc brakes versus old flexi rim brakes paired with some slightly ropey wheels was no contest. In fact, the stopping distance was almost doubled. What though, when you have a good set of wheels with a machined braking surface and a really solid set of rim brakes? The test is a simple one. We ride at 40 kilometers per hour, and then when we hit this line, we jam the brakes on. Just how long does it take these bikes to slow down? Run number one is going to be this Canyon Endurace mid-range bike. And on it, we've got Shimano 105 rim brakes. The caliper itself is made out of aluminium, meaning that it is light, and it's also stiff. And that's the really important part, because it means that the braking force exerted by your fingers is transferred through the cable and then directly into the pads and therefore onto the rim, slowing you down. With a flexier caliper, although your power does still eventually get to the rim, the flex in the caliper means that you don't have quite as much control or as much feel over what is happening with the brakes. The other factor that should help this bike slow down quickly is the wheels. So we've got Mavic Axioms on here, that, again made out of aluminium, and they've got a CNC machined brake track. And that means that it's almost a perfect surface for those brake pads to grab onto. Run number two, disc brakes. 
Now, not much can be said about disc brakes that has not been said before. Inside the brake line, we've got hydraulic fluid as opposed to a steel cable, so that improves the responsiveness of them even further. And while those Mavic rims are very nicely machined indeed, so too are our disc rotors. And whereas with the rim brakes, we've just got rubber pads being squished against them, the pads inside the disc brake are a much, much harder non-rubber compound. So again, that improves the responsiveness. And while we might not need all the power that these brakes offer, what we will take advantage of is the extra modulation that allows us to use that power more effectively. Well, almost identical. Has that taken us by surprise? Not particularly actually, it has to be said, because we know that the brakes on the mid-range bike are fantastic and actually disc brakes only really come into their own in the wet and thank goodness today is not wet because unlike disc brakes GCM presenters do not tend to come into our own in the wet. Now there is also a slightly funny thing here we've got to mention in that a mid-range bike is almost always going to come with aluminium rims on there which tend to offer better braking performance than carbon ones. Not always, some carbon rims are on a par with aluminium but there could have been a situation here where were our superbike to have had rim brakes, it may actually have performed worse in this test than our mid-range bike. Although that said, a Dura-Race rim brake caliper would offer better modulation than a 105 one, and particularly if you're able to go for the direct mount option, which means that it bolts onto your frame via two bolts instead of one. That stiffens it up even further. Right then, so far, so good. The difference between the mid-range bike and superbike is pretty small. But will the tables turn? Now the speed's about to go up. Test number three, it's the descent. Unlike the cheap bike before, there's not gonna to be too much of an advantage with braking here, but we've yet to mention the trump card of the superbike. And like its name suggests, the air road, well, it's aerodynamic. Not all superbikes are gonna have that strength, but then we chose this one precisely because it does. The Shimano C40 wheels should save a chunk of time, so the deeper rim on there means that it causes less turbulence as it passes through the air, and that's helped by the wider profile and what's called its toroidal shape. Now, because it's made out of carbon fiber, it's still super lightweight. Were it to be made out of aluminium, like those rims, then it would probably weigh a ton. Now, you can, of course, stick those wheels into any bike, but harder to swap are the aerodynamic handlebar and stem on here, but then even more intrinsic to the air road are the very shapes of the tubes that make up for the frame, and they are designed to cut through the air. Well, just like last time, it is tough to truly put two bikes through their paces downhill on an open road without an unduly high risk of serious injury or death. But nevertheless, once again, the air road steals a victory. Why? Well, we can only guess, but the aforementioned aerodynamics will likely be playing a role, and the increased modulation of the discs also instilled a greater feeling of confidence in us, meaning that we were able to brake later and harder. <laughs> It's challenge number four, and it's crunch time. You remember this? It's the time trial. Completely flat course, out and back. And I suspect that just as when we put our bargain bucket bike against a super bike, this one is gonna to totally crush it. Because aerodynamics are even more important than people think. And that bike is aero. And this one is not. And I get to go on this one first. You do make it look aero, mate. It does, look at that. It's just built for speed, isn't it? Depends who's riding it. Well, no, actually, no, it doesn't. It's built for speed no matter who's Thanks, riding mate. it. Thanks, mate, yeah. Boop, 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 boop. You should have held me up, actually. Go on, Si. Beep, 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 beep. Around 300, kept it. Uh, 
8.39. That's my time. God, a bit rusty there, mate, but it felt fast. Yeah. So it felt fast. What about yours? It felt really good, actually. Like, it's got to be said, it's a world away from that cheap bike. You know, like, it feels fast like a proper road bike. Uh, but I just have a feeling it's just going to be just not quite as quick as that one. No, I mean, it, this, this is, like I said, it's really comfy. The only thing that's wrong with it is the engine at the moment. But, uh, but no, it felt certainly felt as quick as I could push it anyway, mate. So. Yeah. <sighs> quick change and then... Two, yeah, give it another nudge. Superbike time for you, okay? Three, two, one. Beep. Well, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> yeah. Should we go find somewhere for a coffee and a piece of cake? get through these results. Perfetto. You know what, Matt? I'm not entirely sure what to think here. That mid-range bike clearly represents such great performance for the price. It's kind of leaving me wondering exactly what it is about a super bike that's so super. Hmm. Well, one thing's for certain, Si, it's good news because after our cheap bike, the super bike test, we were just left a little bit concerned at the cavernous gap in performance and it's actually reassuring to know that uh, cycling isn't the preserve of the super rich. Yeah. And maybe we're not as elitist as a lot of people previously thought. Yeah, that is right, isn't it, actually? Because while there's nothing stopping the rider of our mega cheap eBay bike from having fun, the bike was seemingly stopping us from riding fast. Whereas in this case, that mid-range bike is super good fun and it is pretty darn fast as well. I mean, the frame is what, 400 grams heavier. The group set behaves flawlessly. And even when we try and put it to the sword aerodynamically, you know, it wasn't that far behind. It's a lot of extra money for relatively minor performance gains, yet just the feel of it is far more engaging. It's more agile, it's more responsive. It's like it's willing you on. At this point, I suspect that you are gonna be split on this. For many of you, this is just a sign that you do indeed get minimal return for your extra investment when you buy a superbike. It is, of course, predominantly about the rider. And actually, you probably think that Matt's previous statement is just a bit fluffy. Sorry, Matt, it's true. But then, for many of you, you're gonna agree wholeheartedly with Matt and that yes, you can't actually explain the difference between these two bikes with stopwatch alone. Can you quantify just what makes that superbike so rewarding to ride? Well, clearly, Si, there has to be something tangible that distinguishes superbikes because many people are lucky enough to own them. And if that wasn't the case, they wouldn't. Now, us as cyclists, it's a fact, have become far more attuned at noticing very small differences. Yeah. So drop your tire pressure, for example, by 20 PSI, and you'll know about it. Drop your saddle height by two mil, and it's gonna drive you insane. So as long as there's gonna be a measurable difference, you'll know about it. So whether it's downhill, whether it's on a climb, whether it's braking, or whether it's on the flat, it's no surprise that we can still perceive that. Yeah, that is true actually, isn't it, when you think about it? Because if you extrapolate out our short tests, you know, in percentage terms, on the climb, it was two, 2%. Two yep. On the TT, it was 4%. So over an hour's ride, that would then be, what, two and a half minutes, roughly? And so on a two-hour ride, that's five minutes, quick maths there, and you would definitely notice if you got to the cafe, like, five minutes earlier, wouldn't you? So would your mates as well. That's a good point, actually. And not only that, you'd also have to buy another coffee, wouldn't you? But I, I still I can't get away from the fact that that Endurace gives you so much bike for the money. I mean, it's, in terms of the group set alone, when the bikes that we were racing on not 10 years ago, the Durace, I don't think was as good as this 105. I mean, it was 10 speed, this is 11 speed. The shifters were a lot bulkier. Like, that's just, that's amazing. That costs a grand and you could race on it brilliantly. I, know. I mean, there's no doubt the difference between our eBay bike and the mid-range bike is vast. And we should also throw in another slight curveball when buying a superbike. Now, although it performs better in every regard. Spending that bit more money also allows you to tailor the bike. Now, 7.2 kilograms is pretty light, but you could buy one for five kilograms and climb faster. Yeah, you could. Or actually, you swap out the wheels on that one for deeper ones, and you could go even faster on the flats 
and on descent as well. So having more money does allow you more choice, doesn't it? But that still leaves plenty of room to go further and find value in a superbike. Yeah, the differences aren't that big, but they're still significant and measurable. And that doesn't even take into account the kind of unquantifiable side of things as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, like we said, you get to the cafe five minutes earlier. That's measurable and significant, isn't it? Definitely. Measurable in terms of time and also finances, because you've got to fund that extra flat white. And probably caffeine dehydration on top of that as well. Yeah, complex topic. Now, I would imagine that this is going to stir up quite a bit of debate. So if you are not in the comment section already, please head down there now and let us know what you think on this subject. Do you feel that there isn't enough of a difference between a mid-range bike and a super bike to justify that extra expense? Or do you feel that you can easily justify a super bike if you can afford one? Make sure you let us know. Yeah. Now, if you want just a little bit more of a detailed look at this very subject, why not watch our Geek Edition over on the Tech Channel to find out. Yeah.